Something out there is killing man's best friend. It was built just like a hyena. In central Maine, there's been these stories for probably over a hundred years of some kind of large animal decimating other animals. History supports the idea of unknown hybrid or mutant canines. The hybridization of wolves with domesticated dogs it has been known to happen. Now, there could be evidence. I knew this creature was real and now I have proof. Science explores the probability and uncovers a strange image. I see something, the, the horse carcass is covered up with snow, but there's some kind of an image on the back side of the horse. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. There are an estimated 73 million pet dogs in the United States. And something may be hunting them. A mutant canine reported across the country, but primarily in Maine and Minnesota. The head wasn't dog-like, it was cat-like. Um, it had a really horrible smell. 20 years, a long nose, big teeth, and like hair coming out of his nose. It looked uh, more wolfish or possibly husky, malamute, something. And the worst thing that got me going is that, that the shape of this sucker. Big as a collie, maybe even bigger. And he had long black and gray hair. Most modern eyewitnesses describe a canine-like beast about 120 pounds with a flat snout, broad hunched shoulders, short mangled ears, and a bushy tail. A description not unlike a beast reported centuries earlier. I've got reports uh, from Native Americans, from folklore, from colonial times back two, three hundred years. Lauren Coleman is one of the world's leading cryptozoologists with almost 50 years experience in the field. Author of Mysterious America, Coleman is very familiar with the mutant beast stories. You have these reports of rather large wolf-like animals, almost like they're prehistoric dire wolf kind of creatures. About the same weight as the modern gray wolf, the dire wolf had a much larger broad head with massive teeth for crushing bone. Its legs were also shorter, supporting a thicker, more sturdy body. Experts say the dire died out 10,000 years ago but modern eyewitnesses report a similar creature. August 12, 2006, Turner, Maine, located 50 miles from Portland, Maine. Michelle O'Donnell was with her dog, Bucko. One afternoon I was sitting at my dining room table and my dog was going off. I looked out and saw an animal run across my yard and stop at a banking up on the far side of my driveway. I ran out the door and I got probably 10, 15 feet away from it and we just locked eyes and I went to take a step closer and it bolted off and my husband saw it run off through the back part of the yard and we'd never seen anything like that before in our lives. O'Donnell described the beast as wild looking but not a wolf. It had large jaws and huge eyes. It was also much larger than any dog she had seen before. Confused by what she observed, Come on. Michelle began to research animals on the internet, but could not find anything that matched what she saw. However, only a few days later, after receiving a tip from a neighbor, she discovered the creature's body only two blocks from her home. When I walked up to the animal and I looked down, I knew it was exactly what I saw the week before. There was no doubt in my mind. This is the area where we found the animal and I came to take pictures. It came to lay to rest right here. It was probably about this wide full length of the body, maybe about a yard, yard and a half. 
These are the pictures. The heavy body and large jaws look like a dire wolf. But not the flat nose, bug-like eyes, and lopped ears. A few days later, she decided to send the photos to a local newspaper, where reporter Mark Laflamme of the Lewiston Sun Journal got his first look at the so-called Turner Beast. She sent me an email, asked me if I was interested in seeing photos of the animal. And I, I went out there and she had several high quality photos. I looked them over and nothing I could identify. It was a strange looking creature, to be sure. Take a couple bait pails down with us. For Laflamme and many other local residents, the bigger question is, are there more of these mutant canines out there? In an effort to find out, Laflamme has enlisted the support of local animal control officer, Wendell Strout. Right there. Well, we're going to see if we can get that tree big enough to strap the camera on, and then we'll put the bait over there on the pile. Together, they will deploy a number of motion-activated game cameras. Make, this, make sure this is all powered up right. I'm going to put it in test mode. We'll go to, what did we put on the other one's map? Three? Yeah, that's good. They will also set baited live game traps in and around the area where the mutant carcass was found. Let's put the bait in here, Mark. Oh, yeah, it looks good, too, but that uh, looks nice. Can you get on this end? Yeah, this goes right in here. That's it, and it's all set. You can leave it. The odor is probably good. It's getting warmer out. So, yeah, it'll probably attract something. Well, I think there's a lot of people who, who really feel that there's something exotic or mysterious out there, and, you know, the, the Turner Beast aside, there's something, if there's something still roaming out there, I think it's, you know, in everybody's best interest to find it, find out whatever it is, and learn as much as we can about it. Michelle O'Donnell's photos are not the only evidence of a mutant canine. The Shunka Waranki is a creature that we know from Montana. This photo is the only proof of the Shunkawarakeen. This Iowa Amerindian name means to carry off dogs. In the 1880s, a Montana ranger claimed he killed a strange animal, had it stuffed and displayed. This picture appeared in a book in 1977, the only evidence of the claim since the stuffed specimen had disappeared. It was very much like the, the main mystery creature, having large haunches, wolf-like, uh, scruffy fur, uh, and it doesn't quite look like a wolf. Neither did the creature sighted in Rolod, Minnesota, located about 220 miles from Minneapolis. An eyewitness says a mutant canine is terrorizing his farm and killing his pet dog. A little over six years ago, the neighbor went into a nursing home and uh, I told him I'd take care of his, his Jack Russell Terrier. My neighbor Palmer had named him Fifi and I didn't think that was quite manly enough, so I just called him Fifi. Wendell Olson has been a farmer all his life. It's a peaceful living, except for one night in September of 2006. Mm. And I put him out uh, one night, and he just uh, disappeared. I grabbed the flashlight and went around looking everywhere for it. And uh, I suppose it was about 10 minutes after it disappeared, uh, just to the south of the house here, I heard some uh, kind of a yelpish uh, scream and then some gasping. You know, I've never quite heard anything like it. Uh, it was kind of a breathy type of scream. And then it, it would just went quiet. So I assume that's it was dying, you know. Something was biting it or choking it in some way. He never did find the body. Hey, Chief! Hey, boy! Hey, boy! Hey, 
Hey, thief, where are you? Hey, boy. Searched everywhere for uh, a week. Uh, the first three days, I hardly got any sleep looking for the dog. I called everybody, called the Humane Society, tried to cover all the bases, and uh, walked through the woods with my other dog, and I could not find a, a hair or any sign of the dog. You know, I kind of feel that I failed on my promise to Palmer to take care of his dog when he had to die that way. So I, I, I do not feel good about it at all. The mystery on Wendell's farm deepens. About one month after Fief went missing, another attack occurred. This time, the victim was much larger. Wendell Olson's dog, Fief, is gone, fallen victim to an unknown predator. And I put him out uh, one night and he just uh, disappeared. One month later, Olson's farm is hit again. This time, the victim is a 700-pound colt, one of the animals Fief had been protecting. I have stallions up in the yard, and I had just moved the mares to a closer pasture. But there was an awful lot of whinnying all night long. Uh, but I thought, well, it's just because the mares are closer. But I, I went out in the morning, and uh, the horses were all standing on the opposite end of the pasture and the little one was missing. And I looked over there at the other opposite edge towards the woods and there it was laying there. And I figured, well, is it sick? Uh, you know, and then the closer I got, I could see it wasn't in a natural position. Then I, when I got up to it, the entire throat and the ear was missing. A local Department of Natural Resources agent came out to investigate the incident and believes the culprit is most likely dogs or coyotes. But Wendell does not agree. Four weeks later, he saw the beast. I was out cutting alfalfa and I was looking at nine deer uh, grazing on the edge of the field and all of a sudden they scattered and I got a glimpse of something that went over the hill uh, by the deer and I just got like two jumps of it but it looked bigger than a coyote uh, it looked uh, more wolfish or possibly husky malamute something the gray wolf or timber wolf is well established in Minnesota. In 2007, it was even taken off the state's endangered species list. Wildlife officials estimate there are over 3,000 timber wolves in Minnesota. The largest weigh in at over 150 pounds and as a pack are capable of taking down a one ton buffalo. While timber wolves are common in the northern forests of Minnesota, they are rarely seen in the more open western plains near Rolog. At nearly three times the size of an average coyote or dog, a timber wolf could be responsible for the attack. Wendell has called in the support of wildlife and optics expert Craig Enervold. There is something Enervold has to see. Woods and water, and, and there's actually no field down there, nothing's mm -hmm. pastured, so it's pretty well. They've been back here, there's not much left of it. So they've been here quite a bit. A deer, freshly killed. They scan the area for evidence. You clearly see it was coyote tracks. Coyote tracks could indicate the deer was killed by coyotes, or just that coyotes had feasted on the dead body. Either way, the carcass is bait for whatever else may be out there. I think with all the activity you've got actually behind here, I think that on that tree there facing right over the top of the kill would be probably an ideal spot to put that camera. Okay, all right. Well, we've got the batteries replacing this one here and everything seems to be working okay. The settings are right for the, what we're going to have for our setup here. We've got a great location in here to set this one up on. We've got the, uh, the kill site's about 10 feet from the tree, which will be a perfect location. An active feeding site should bring predators in from miles around, within range of the cameras. But even with a good photo, an animal's identity can be hard to determine. This is the case with the turn of beast photos taken by Michelle O'Donnell in Maine. One detail that's intriguing is the tasseled ears. In 1906, the Lewiston, Maine Daily Sun reported that something had been seen lurking in the fields, menacing local pickers. It was described as brown, with tasseled ears. They called it the Engine Devil. 
Coincidence? Lots of canines have tasseled ears. But if there is a unique creature in Maine, these remains will prove it. These are the actual bones of the creature after it decomposed in O'Donnell's garage. What we have here are the fleshy remains of the carcass. Uh, it's got fur, flesh. Um, we're going to be sending this as well to NYU for further DNA testing. If DNA testing proves it's a unique species, it's a huge find. But it also means there would have to be more than one. While Michelle's samples of the creature are headed to NYU, two other Mainers recall a terrifying run-in in 1991. It's not what they saw, but what they heard. I fell asleep, I think it was around 11. I heard something, and I woke up. And I thought, well, it's just the, the curtain scraping the window. So I kind of just blew it off. And then I heard something again. And it really, really scared me. It was like something evil was outside the window. I shook Leo, and he woke up. The noise that we heard uh, certainly wasn't something that we've heard before, such as a deer or a moose. What I heard was the breathing. And that's what scared me more than anything. It was breathing of a creature that had run a long distance. It was snorting from being out of breath. But I tell you what, never heard anything like that ever, and I don't ever want to hear it again. While the Davids never saw the creature, they believe the sounds were not of any native animal. Stories of this nature, in my experience, have always been uh, got a huge reaction. And this case was no, this was, was bigger than just about anything I'd written. I know people, you know, they fear the unknown, but they're also fascinated by it. I mean, they 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 want to hear about it. They want to level their own guesses. They want to talk about it with their neighbors. This is something that might be creeping around the, the main woods, and in Maine there are a lot of woods. So if there's something out there, they're obviously going to be interested. There may be a real animal responsible for what the Davids heard that night, a beast they have good reason to fear. For centuries, eyewitnesses in Maine have reported mutant canines. One theory, they are surviving dire wolves believed to have died out 10,000 years ago. But while the Turner beast resembles a dire wolf in size and proportion, its hunched shoulders, flat snout and big eyes seem to point to a beast of an unnatural mix. You get a hybrid dog by mating two dogs. It, it is basically how that happens. It's the same as a mutt. A mutt would be a hybrid to a certain extent. Veterinarian Jay Epping says crossbreeding in many types of animals is now common. A hybrid dog is basically the, the same as a crossbreed. It, it, it's a mix of two breeds of dogs. All major dog breeds that we have today are all hybrid dogs or crossbreeds. But crossbreeding in the wild is a very different animal. When two species that are close enough can breed and produce a viable uh, you know, offspring. We know about you know, mules and we know about uh, the dolphins and whales. And uh, There's a lot of creatures that are hybridizing. To some, the turnip beast looks like a chow rottweiler wolf hybrid. This unique mix could explain the appearance of the beast and its unusual behavior. There's no way to define what you end up with when you mix a wolf and a dog. You may end up, it may, it may be said that you end up with a, a wolf that's less fearful of humans, but what you end up having is an animal about which we know nothing. Wolf expert and executive director of the Wildlife Science Center, Peggy Callahan has seen the results of wolf-dog mixes. We don't know their impact on deer, we don't know their impact on livestock, although we can make some assumptions. We don't understand how they handle disease. Is it different than wolves? Is it different than dogs? There are many, many unknowns that, about these creatures. While rare, it is possible for dogs to breed in the wild with wolves. However, niche breeders do mix dogs with wolves in captivity. An animal could have been released intentionally or accidentally 
into the water. What if one survives and breeds back with wolves? What is that creature going to be called? And, and what are we going to expect physically and behaviorally from that creature? Depending on what type of dog is mixed with the wolf, the offspring's color, size, and general appearance can vary greatly. The DNA samples at NYU will hopefully reveal the genetic background of the Turner Beast. But can it explain the other sightings in Maine or in Minnesota? There may be a more natural explanation for some accounts. Some experts believe the creature may be part of the weasel family. The fisher can grow to four feet long, but is very light in stature and has been known to make a sound that sounds like a baby screaming. Similar to the sound Leo and Martha David heard in 1991. And then, there's the Wolverine. An even more likely candidate from the weasel family. The Wolverine is shorter but much heavier than the Fisher, resembling a small bear with a long tail. They are also said to be fearless, known to take down prey as large as a moose, and fight over scraps with black bears. Both animals are found in Maine and Minnesota and would likely defend themselves when confronted by a dog. Could one creature be responsible for the David's sighting in Litchfield? O'Donnell's in Turner and another account just miles away in Wales, Maine. Well, when he first turned, it looked like a friggin' werewolf. That, honest to God, it had the gray hair, the long ears, the, the fangs, and, the thing, and it had like a a long, snotty nose. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was our werewolf movie. This time, the victim was a strong 50-pound Doberman named the Duchess. Well, I got Duchess when she was a little pup. She was about two months old. And I got her from the neighbor down the road here. She was really part of the family. You know, I could leave the doors unlocked. And I didn't have to worry about nothing. First time I started hearing things outside was late in the evening. And I heard the dog barking and like whining. And I get dressed, I came outside, put the lights on, everything, and everything looked normal. Looked up and down the driveway and didn't see nothing. So I went back in and we went back to bed. Early in the morning we had another commotion. This is close to around six o'clock in the morning, I believe, six o'clock, seven o'clock. I went outside and I saw the dog in the doghouse just looking at me. And I saw the dog again just laying there. And she was all covered with blood and all that. And I went to look at the doghouse and I see that she was in a fight or something. But she was all caught up. She was having a real hard time breathing. I entitled her, we bring her in the house and I called the vet. I explained what, what happened. And he said that uh, he couldn't do anything for her. He said the best thing to do was put her out of the misery. Just a few nights later, and still grieving, Michaud saw the killer at his doorstep, likely returning to finish what it had started. It was well into two to three o'clock in the morning. I was coming home after being with friends. I drove my driveway, and I noticed something on the steps up by a front door. It looked like a wolf, but it wasn't a wolf or anything. It was none like I've ever seen. He had like a paw on the step and like sniffing underneath the door, like to see what was inside. And uh, then when I got a little closer, he turned and looked at me. And uh, he just stood there for a few seconds and like growled at me. Then he walked real slow around my, my car door. And then he went towards the brush pile. That's when I noticed they had a, a den there because I never noticed it before. It looked just like a wolverine, until, but the head was different. That's why I was explaining to these other people what it was. They kept saying it was a fisher or something like that, a bobcat. I said, that ain't it. I've been hunting all my life in these woods, and I know what the difference is. That night, I, I pretty well fought in the, the den. I was so mad, I drove my car over to put my tractor over it, trying to get it out, and it was in there. And I had no, no luck doing it because I didn't want that around my kids. And to be so close to the house is it's unbearable.
Well, we set the trap out back in the field and baited it, and hopefully we can bring in some wildlife uh, over the next couple, three days. We'll check it every 24 hours and uh, see what happens. Is it a weasel, wolf-dog hybrid, or different animals involved in coincidental attacks? Well, people want to know what's out there roaming in their backyards. And I don't think anybody's going to be satisfied with the answers that we have so far. It's on and we should be good. Let's go set the bait. People have looked hard at the uh, photographs of the uh, animal found out in Turner, and they, they said clearly, this is not the animal that attacked my dog, or this is not the animal I saw at the side of the road. This doesn't solve the mystery. They still want answers. Another Monster Quest search is underway in Minnesota, where Craig Enervold is setting his traps. Camera traps are the, the trail cameras that we've got set up now. Uh, we just set up in areas of high game activity. And like we've got here with the trails that kind of run through and the activity around the, the specific kill site is, um, is an easy indicator that we're going to get some activity on the cameras. Uh, again, whether it be the trail or, or the site, that just the, the putting the food source on there is enough in itself to attract animals from a great distance. After I close the box, it'll just do a countdown and we'll be ready to take pictures. So we'll just tighten yeah, that there. Take pictures and it's walking. Hennevold also places another stealth cam digital game view camera near a dead horse that Wendell Olson recently lost to illness. Anytime they run across the scent of something dead in the woods, they typically investigate it and if it's something fresh that, that they can uh, make a meal out of it or, or stage it and feed off it for a while, they'll take full advantage of that. And uh, that's why a location like this here with this type of a, of a kill, it's, it's absolute great opportunity and a great food source for animals for, for quite a while. And it does not take long before the camera trap begins snapping pictures of something. In the past 20 years, there have been a handful of sightings of mysterious beasts lurking in the Maine woods. While some people like Leo and Martha David only heard the creature, others like Leo Doyon had a closer encounter. His was in 2004. I come out here, I had a cup of coffee and a cigarette, and you know, just looking around and this creature comes out. And the color. The color was uh, blackish, with a lot of rust in it, the yellowish light. Uh, and then the worst thing that got me going is that, that the shape of this sucker. I mean, it wasn't like a, a dog standing up straight, it was more of a tilt. And it looked right at me. And the eyes, the eyes were reddish like, you know, looked like you, they was piercing right through you. And then he took off. He just slowly walked off like nobody's business. You know? If I didn't know any better, I'd say it's hyena. It was built just like a hyena. The hyena angle is worth investigating. In August 2006, this photo was captured by Jacob Patton of Hovland, Minnesota, along the north shore of Lake Superior. To many, this animal looks like a cross between a hyena and wolf, but there is a problem with this particular hybrid theory. Well, hyenas, for instance, are not related to dogs. You know, they're really a separate species, so the interbreeding with dogs, with uh, domestic dogs, with wolves, with uh, coyotes, would not happen. This photo is actually a coyote infected with mange, a common ailment found in Maine and Minnesota in many different wild animals. When you experience an animal that's that's been infected with mange, uh, you know the the, the sight can, uh, of of an animal like that without hair on it could be something that like totally different than you've ever seen in an animal before. It's a type of mite that that lives on the skin and feeds on feeds on proteins on the skin, and if left on loss, and the hair loss is really what compromises wild animals. Uh, they could have a tail that's nothing but a bone spike and uh, you know, you know, patchy hairs, bald spots you know, throughout the body. I mean, it's really a horrendous look when you see an animal like that because it doesn't, without hair, it just, they, they, they look totally different than, than what they're supposed to represent. Not only does it affect the appearance of the animal, 
but their weakened state may drive them to seek an easy meal, like a house pet. The motion-activated cameras have been snapping pictures for the last 72 hours. The areas that we picked were secluded areas, a lot of wildlife. Um, the wildlife's comfortable there, not a lot of foot traffic, not a lot of people, and we felt we'd get the most activity there. Four cameras and dozens of pictures later, the images baffle the experts. In this shot, something is missing. When you compared the photo before and the photo after, you clearly see bait in this image. And in the next, the bait is gone. Something had to take it, but what? A camera glitch or a stealthy animal prevented the camera from taking photos. For the team in Maine, it's clear something is there. But for now, it's a dead end. La Flamme says the search isn't over. I would absolutely love to see a, a photograph or a series of photographs of something, of something that hasn't been tampered with, that's, that's clear, clear enough for people to look at and, and make the judgment, okay, this is something unusual, this is something we haven't seen before. Um, we can't explain these photographs. You know, let's put a little more effort into this and try to see what's going on out there. Back in Minnesota, Craig Enervold is hoping to solve the mystery, too. But first, he wants to make one last effort to lure the beast closer. We've got our trail cameras put out, and uh, we're going to set up for a call sequence now. Blasting rabid distress calls is like blood in the water for a shark, bringing in predators from miles away. We've got some area off to the, to, the, uh, to the north here that's got some real open country, some wooded area, which is very typical, good area for coyotes. They're, they're normally coming on the first call sequence. And uh, so we'll let, let the call rest, we'll shut it down for a bit, and then kind of watch and wait and see if something comes up over the top of the hill. The distress calls have no immediate results. However, they may lure a predator closer and within range of the cameras. We've got the uh, kill sites, we've got uh, the cameras set up, and we've got time. Uh, we'll let them sit for a few days. We'll come back and check the activity and, and kind of get an idea of what we have in the area here. The cameras have been out for seven days, and Enervold is anxious to see if the camera traps have produced any results. Okay, we've picked up all of our trail cameras that we've had set up for over a week and we're going to walk back to the vehicle with them and download them into the computer and see what kind of activity we've had on them. Okay, we've got, uh, got some images downloaded off that first camera here. It looks like we've got about uh, oh, 15, 18 different images here. Uh, as I scroll through, let's see that first night we've got some deer activity on it. Uh, snow's falling. Got some really good close-ups of deer here. They look really inquisitive. They're kind of spending a lot of time around the site of the camera here. Got a couple images of deer kind of looking back towards the farm. Must be some activity going back there. There's they're a little suspect of. Another camera was set up, overlooking the carcass of a horse on Wendell Olson's farm. There's some snow coming down here. A lot of snow getting on the horse carcass, almost to the point where you can't hardly see it anymore. And here we got an image of something that came in to investigate. Got the ears turned out and just see kind of a, almost an overexposure, but it, it's got a long nose. Can't really make it out, but just because of the length of the nose, it sure looks like it could be a white-tailed deer that got in between the horse carcass and the camera. The horse carcass attracts more than wildlife. In a strange but very human act, one of Wendell's other horses comes to check out the remains, almost like a final tribute to his fallen friend. And as Craig continues to examine the photos, he makes an interesting discovery. Okay, there's a, there's a couple images here that I'm looking at that, that uh, that certainly show there's something on the kill site. I, I, I see something. The, the horse carcass is covered up with snow, but there's there's some kind of an image on the back side of the horse. You can just see the top of its back. It's a dark image.
If a mysterious hybrid creature is really living undetected in the woods of New England and Minnesota, it is a mangy animal with wild eyes, a terrifying howl, and a need to mangle or kill dogs. This man said he saw the creature walk across his yard. This woman and her husband said it had a howl like a crying baby. This Maine resident believes it attacked his Doberman Pinscher. This farmer lost both a dog and a horse. And this woman collected the best evidence yet when she found a dead mutant looking canine and snapped a picture that circled the internet in hours. This whole experience changed my life. Michelle O'Donnell believes this creature is not just a normal dog. When I saw that animal face to face and we locked eyes, it's, it's just something I'm never going to forget. It's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. She kept the carcass. Something about it sparked a lot of internet debate. It seemed to have one more claw than a regular dog. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are getting very confused by this fifth claw. Uh, most dogs show four claws in their prints, and then behind the regular paw is a fifth claw, which is called the dew claw. Based on grooming and nail issues and things like that, we've learned to remove those, or for hunting dogs, those are often a source of, of problems. If they're tramping through the brush, they can tear those. Some owners want them, to, you know, want them removed, basically, so they don't have to trim the nail for ease. There's been media reports that it was a strange animal because it had five claws. and It wasn't necessarily strange. It was just a, a dog that hadn't been uh, taken care of and hadn't been domesticated, really. Although O'Donnell has remained steadfast in her belief that the creature is not a normal dog, what do the experts say? Dr. Jay Epping is a veterinarian with more than 10 years' experience working with dogs. He's examined the photo closely. And it basically looks to me like it's a dog that's been in the wild for probably, you know, three or four years. Looks like the ears are kind of, you know, stunted, which could have been maybe from a little frostbite, something like that. I mean, it looks kind of mangy. He had these, you know, hair loss patches, whether or not that was from decay or not, you know, from the, from the body being out in the wild for who knows how long. Well, I believe the Turner Beast, based on my examination of a photograph, would, would have to be a dog. Photographs. Wolf expert Peggy Callahan also has her opinion on what is in the photos. This could easily be a dog. It certainly is not a wolf. It could be a mix of the two. This picture shows uh, a canid. This is clearly a, a, a canid. But he's got a very short nose. Uh, that's not a wolf characteristic at all. He's been dead a while. Uh, his eye is bulging. He's, he's quite swollen. Um, um, from post-mortem changes, so it makes it a little bit difficult to to diagnose uh, much other than the fact that he's not a pure wolf. If this is just a domestic dog with mange, then becoming feral may explain the strange appearance. Domesticated dogs are not built for living in the wild. The sub-zero temperatures and battles with other wild animals can cause them to lose ears, tails, teeth, and fur. As they try to cope with an environment, they were not bred to live in. Feral dogs, from what research shows us, uh, is a stray. They're domestic dogs that, that don't survive without a human-based food source. Feral dogs may be looking for dog food when they encounter the owner of the food. Your pet. A wolf or a coyote or a fox or etc. are hunting on their own. But stray dogs, there's no evidence that they're actually surviving by hunting. They are surviving because they found a garbage dump. They found our, a food source from humans. They're stealing, uh, but they're not, they're not surviving. Hunger can be a strong motivator, but these are just theories for the turn of beast. DNA evidence may provide proof. Michelle held on to the carcass and sent a tissue sample to be DNA tested at New York University by Todd DeSotel. I have taken a tissue sample supplied to me from a creature in Maine, extracted the DNA, sequenced it, and from the analysis of that DNA sequence, I can conclude it was a domestic dog. However, his conclusion does not rule out the possibility 
of a wolf mix. The, the father of the um, individual that we sequenced could indeed be a wolf. Um, unlikely a coyote, but it could indeed be a wolf. Domestic dogs and wolves are extraordinarily close genetically, and in fact, domestic dogs seem to have been derived several times from different sort of subspecies of wolves. If the creature was a hybrid, which is sort of more likely than being an unknown mutant, um, the mother clearly was a domestic dog, and the father potentially could be a wolf. A much more extensive testing, DNA testing, of say the Y chromosome and other markers would have to be done. The sample was uh, pretty degraded, so I'm not sure if we would be able to get it out of that. Despite the analysis of the Turner Beast photos and DNA results, many locals are convinced there is something still out there. Possibly more dog killers. I've never seen anything like it. No, never. I know what a wolf looks like. I know what a hybrid dog looks like. And I know what a, what a fisher looks like. I'll tell you again, this was none of, none of the above. There's a couple images here that I'm looking at that that certainly show there's something on the kill site. Back in Minnesota, the mystery animal Craig Enervold captured on the camera trap finally makes itself known. Boy, it's a neat image here. I've got a bald eagle standing literally right outside the, the horse carcass. That's really a rare shot. While both expeditions produce numerous pictures, there are none that match the images taken by Michelle O'Donnell and none that provide any answers to what maimed and killed people's dogs. There remains to be a mystery here in Minnesota, obviously, by uh, the fact that trail cameras didn't produce anything, and, and again, we're very hopeful that it would, but uh, certainly things remain inconclusive. Back in Maine, Mark Laflamme accepts the DNA results for the Turner Beast, but he isn't saying all the other sightings are dogs, too. Something unknown is, is, is walking through the woods at, in, in Maine and only appears now and then, and it's very elusive and very mysterious, and people still want to know what it is. Well, I know the creature's still out there. We've still seen that. And they claim they, they got one in the paper, but it didn't look nothing like what attacked my dog. And history shows that this thing has, uh, is sighted over and over again. I have a feeling of the future will bear that out. I have a feeling I'll be reporting on this mystery Maine creature again. I mean, I think that we really have to expand our mind to really try to look at, in a skeptical and critical way, all the possibilities before we fully accept that this is a new species or a new animal. For Wendell Olson, the farmer who lost his dog and one of his colts, the loss is still hard to deal with. You know, I kind of feel that I failed on my promise to Palmer to take care of his dog when he had to die that way. Time passes, and the seasons change for those individuals who lost their beloved dog. One of the hardest things I had to do, you know, the family pet for years, just shot her, and, uh, put her out of her misery. I still miss the dog a lot. Whether it's a wild dog or something else in Maine and Minnesota, there is something out there killing man's best friend. And with such a vicious creature in the woods, no canine lover can truly be at peace they let their dogs out at night. <laughs>